Cryptocurrency's purpose is to replace the existing financial system. This not only includes replacing fiat currencies with hard money like BTC, but also replacing financial intermediaries with DeFi protocols. This makes DeFi protocols direct competitors to commercial banks and central banks, and that's why the report about DeFi recently published by the United States Federal Reserve is so significant. Today, I'm going to summarize what the Fed's DeFi report says in simple terms, give you my thoughts as we go along, and tell you what it could mean for the crypto market. The Fed's DeFi report is titled, quote, Decentralized Finance, DeFi, Transformative Potential and Associated Risks. It appears to have been written in June, but was only published late last month. I'll get into why that might be a little later. In any case, you can find the full text in the description. So, the report begins with a brief overview, wherein the authors effectively reiterate what I mentioned a few moments ago. Quote, DeFi products and services are conducted without a trusted central intermediary, such as a bank, and they include payments, lending and borrowing, trading and investments, capital raising, crowdfunding, and insurance. As a fun fact, crowdfunding via cryptocurrency ICOs is considered to be one of the most powerful tools in cryptocurrency, as it allowed both crypto projects like Ethereum and cryptocurrency exchanges like Binance to get off the ground. Given that retail investors arguably have a tendency to crowdfund projects that seek to disrupt the status quo, it should come as no surprise that countries around the world seem to be moving towards restricting retail access to cryptocurrency. More about that in the description. Now, what's interesting is that the authors seem to consider Bitcoin to be the first DeFi protocol, as it made it possible to send and receive BTC payments in a trustless manner. This is consistent with the author's definition of DeFi I mentioned a few moments ago, but interesting nonetheless. The authors point to the proliferation of smart contract cryptocurrencies as the precursor to the explosion of decentralized finance, which makes sense given that extensive programmability is required for most DeFi protocols to work. The authors note Ethereum as being the most popular smart contract cryptocurrency for DeFi, but acknowledge that Avalanche and Solana are starting to become popular as well. They also acknowledge that many DeFi protocols have gone multi-chain before going on to highlight the $224 billion in total value locked in DeFi protocols, a figure which was obviously recorded earlier this year. Even though this figure is still a fraction of the global financial system, the authors caution that DeFi is growing very quickly, and I suppose it was until May. Now, while the authors caution that DeFi is growing quickly, they don't seem to be all that concerned, and that's for one simple reason, scalability. Smart contract cryptocurrencies can't currently scale to support global adoption, but the authors believe they could with the right scaling solutions. The authors then outline two scenarios they foresee when it comes to DeFi adoption. Either DeFi evolves to become interoperable or even integrated with the existing financial system, or it evolves to become its own financial system, which would be the preferable outcome for crypto, in my opinion. As far as the authors are concerned, which of the two scenarios unfolds is ultimately irrelevant, as they both pose financial stability concerns, especially since there is a lack of regulation around DeFi. In other words, we can't control it, so it's bad regardless of what it becomes. They go on to lament how, whereas centralized entities in the crypto industry are easy to regulate, decentralized entities can't be coerced with questionable laws and even more questionable sanctions, including some DeFi protocols. I'm being hyperbolic, of course, but you get the point. The second part of the Fed paper is about blockchain basics, and the way the authors explain blockchains and smart contracts was peculiar, to say the least. For example, quote, Consensus protocols regulate the way in which updates to the dataset are proposed, reconciled, and recorded, while ensuring that no other previously validated data have been altered. This immediately reminded me of a DeFi report by the Bank for International Settlements, wherein the author explains how DeFi protocols will exist on permissioned distributed ledgers 
run by banks with regulations at the protocol level. More about that crazy report in the description. Now, the authors go on to explain how blockchains work, and I won't bore you with the details there. However, I will commend them for acknowledging that the Bitcoin blockchain became the first blockchain when the first Bitcoin block was mined in 2009. Bravo! I'll quickly note that blockchain is a term that's often used interchangeably by institutions to describe both cryptocurrencies and the permissioned distributed ledger systems that are operated by centralized entities. In this case, it seems the authors are using the term correctly, which I again commend them for. They then turn to the topic of smart contracts, and I won't bore you with the details here either. However, I will again commend them for underscoring the importance of composability and acknowledging that oracles are required to make most DeFi protocols work. This makes me worry that they could go after popular oracles like Chainlink, etc., to apply regulations to DeFi, but let's not go there yet. Now, the third part of the Fed paper talks about, quote, DeFi products and services. And I must admit, I take issue with the title there because a product or service implies that an intermediary of some kind is involved, which is simply not the case with DeFi protocols. The authors start by repeating that Ethereum is currently the most popular smart contract cryptocurrency for DeFi, but this time add the Binance Smart Chain and Cardano as two additional smart contract cryptocurrencies that are increasing in popularity. Respect. What's interesting is the authors note that, quote, many dApps provide discrete services rather than complex bundles of products. This is interesting because central banks seem to be obsessed with the idea of a one-stop shop for their upcoming central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. As it so happens, the authors also note that, quote, new protocols are beginning to offer a combination of several products in an attempt to become a one-stop shop for financial services. This makes me wonder whether they'll start going after these kinds of DeFi protocols more aggressively. What's even scarier is that the authors single out MakerDAO when discussing governance in DeFi. This is scary because MakerDAO makes it possible to mint a decentralized stablecoin called DAI using cryptocurrency as collateral. Once upon a time, most of the DAI was largely collateralized by ETH, but today it's mostly collateralized by Circle's USDC, a centralized stablecoin. Circle's response to the recent sanctions against Tornado Cash have consequently led to concerns that MakerDAO could be next on the regulatory chopping block. More about what happened to Tornado Cash using the link in the description. Now, what's reassuring is that the authors actually seem to be somewhat supportive of DeFi as they provide some recommendations for how it could be improved, including the introduction of more real-world assets, the creation of more robust stablecoins, and the introduction of CBDCs. That last one threw me off because the authors literally suggest that, quote, the creation of a central bank digital currency, CBDC, that becomes available on public permissionless blockchains such as Ethereum may also serve to reduce volatility. I'm not sure how I feel about that, if I'm being honest. Now, the authors end this section with another insightful comment, and that's that, quote, the direct implication of a fast growth in DeFi predominantly driven by wholesale and possibly institutional investors would be the relevance of financial stability considerations. Put differently, they're concerned that too much institutional interest in DeFi could pose a threat to financial stability, revealing that this is a very real risk that central banks are concerned about. Take a second to consider that this suggests DeFi adoption is much more significant than we think. Anyways, the authors then go on to describe some subcategories of DeFi in detail. These are borrowing and lending protocols, decentralized exchanges or DEXs, derivative DEXs, payment protocols, and asset management protocols. When it comes to borrowing and lending protocols, they point out that about a fifth of all the total value locked in DeFi is coming from this specific niche. Note that these statistics are from earlier this year, but it looks like this market share still stands today. 
What's odd is that the authors note, quote, fees are often denominated in a platform's governance token, which is certainly news to me. As far as I know, all transaction fees on almost all borrowing and lending protocols are paid in the native cryptocurrency coin of whatever blockchain they're on. After describing what appears to be Aave's innovative safety module, the authors note that, quote, lenders may earn an interest rate that exceeds rates offered by banks on sovereign currency denominated deposits, which is a big no-no because it creates competition for the big banks. What's impressive is that the authors go as far as explaining Aave's flash loan functionality, though they again fail to mention the DeFi protocol by name. This is forgivable, however, as they emphasize that there are, quote, legitimate uses of flash loans, such as swapping out crypto collateral on a debt. This is significant because flash loans have been the subject of regulatory scrutiny due to their use in extreme arbitrage trades that have resulted in billions of dollars of damage to DeFi protocols with suboptimal oracles. More about that using the link in the description. I also couldn't help but notice that the authors included MakerDAO in their list of borrowing and lending protocols. Some would say that MakerDAO is technically a collateralized debt protocol, but uh, let's not split any more hairs. When it comes to DEXs, the authors point out that related protocols make up the lion's share of the total value locked in DeFi and briefly explain how DEXs work. You know, liquidity providers, ratio of two assets in a trading pool determining their price, liquidity providers earning trading fees, etc. What's strange is that the authors refer to liquidity providers as, quote, investors and trading fees as, quote, interest, like yield. This is strange because it's the type of language that anti-crypto regulators like the SEC routinely use when justifying their crackdowns on crypto projects. Probably nothing. On a more positive note, the authors correctly state that, quote, Unlike centralized exchanges, DEXs never take custody of user funds, which is important because some centralized exchanges have been hacked, which resulted in a loss of customers' cryptocurrency. Preach. What's unfortunate is that the authors don't spend too much time talking about other DEX-related innovations, such as stablecoin DEXs like Curve Finance and its vote escrowed liquidity mining, but uh, I suppose there's a time and a place for that degree of detail. The section on derivative DEXs is even shorter, and I suspect this is because the authors don't want to give the relevant crypto projects too much advertising. After all, derivative DEXs make it possible to, quote, get price exposure to other digital assets, currencies, commodities, stocks, and indices. As far as the powers that be are concerned, all these investments should only be accessible via a regulated intermediary, hence why regulators came down hard on all cryptocurrency exchanges offering tokenized stocks last spring and summer. Luckily for the incumbents, derivative DEXs seem to be the least popular DeFi niche, accounting for the smallest slice of the pie, according to the author's again outdated estimates, which still seem to hold true. The authors also touch on the use of leverage in derivative DEXs and touch on decentralized prediction markets, which have been subject to lots of regulatory scrutiny in recent months. When it comes to payment-related DeFi protocols, the authors define these as being designed to, quote, overcome one or more obstacles posed by decentralized technology, including issues with efficiency, interoperability, and privacy, to provide a user experience that mimics payments in traditional finance. Accurate. They then go on to explain how Tornado Cash and Flexer Network work, which is slightly suspicious, given that Tornado Cash got sanctioned and Flexa Network's AMP token was recently delisted from a series of crypto exchanges after the SEC called AMP a security in an insider trading case against a Coinbase employee. More about that in the description. The authors also touch on Bitcoin's Lightning Network, which is extremely underrated. More about that in the description too. Now, when it comes to asset management-related DeFi protocols, the authors quickly explain that these DeFi protocols automatically redirect any crypto deposited into them to wherever they will earn the highest yield, among other things. What caught my eye is that liquid staking protocol Lido Finance was at the top of the list, 
potentially foreshadowing regulatory scrutiny for LDO. Let's hope I'm just seeing things, because if this happens, it could be very bad news for Ethereum once it transitions to proof of stake in the next week or so. And yes, you can learn more about that using the link in the description. It's always there, isn't it? Now, the fourth part of the Fed's report concerns the risks associated with DeFi, and it should come as no surprise that this is the longest section of the report by a wide margin. The authors commence by acknowledging that DeFi presents, quote, interesting opportunities for lowering costs, expanding access, and increasing transparency, and reiterate that DeFi is still small relative to the financial system it seeks to replace. Logically, the authors admit that a disruption to DeFi at this point in time would therefore probably have next to no impact on financial stability, but again reiterate that its rapid growth could pose future challenges to financial stability if left unchecked. What's funny is that they say, quote, the current developments in DeFi have the potential to trigger a DeFi version of a financial crisis, possibly with spillovers to the traditional financial system. This is funny because that's basically what happened when Terra imploded in May, and DeFi is doing just fine, thank you very much. The authors then point to high leverage as an area of concern, since high leverage has historically been a primary factor in financial crises. They also say the same for illiquidity, aka the inability to sell a large amount of an asset at the same price without crashing said price. What's hilarious is that the authors caution that DeFi could cause financial stability issues while simultaneously claiming that, quote, the overwhelming majority of the losses in the traditional financial system associated with op risk are merely a cost of doing business. Double standards much? You know, I think US Senator Pat Toomey said it best. Quote, failure should be an option. For reference, this was Pat's response to Terra's catastrophic collapse. Just goes to show you how investor protection is often an excuse for financial control. End of rant. Now, to the author's credit, they admit that, quote, DeFi can reduce some operational risks inherent in traditional finance, particularly those associated with reliance on centralization of financial intermediation activities. However, they caution that DeFi protocols present new risks. The authors then go on to list all the benefits of DeFi, and the first is that blockchains make transaction settlements near instant. By contrast, transactions in the traditional financial system can take days to clear or more, especially if you're dealing with more elaborate investment vehicles. Another benefit is that all transactions on cryptocurrency blockchains are publicly viewable. This makes it easy for investors and regulators to assess the current state of the market, namely the status of market participants and any potential risks they're experiencing. Now, if you think that this isn't possible because cryptocurrency is anonymous, think again. In the words of the authors, quote, pseudonymity does not necessarily guarantee true anonymity in practice. Blockchain analysts have found that it is often possible to associate an address with a specific person or institution by observing transaction counterparties and amounts associated with addresses. If you're wondering how blockchain analytics companies track crypto transactions, you can find out using the link in the description. I digress. Now, a third benefit of DeFi the authors identify is auditability. Cryptocurrency blockchains allow us to check the accuracy of financial statements from individuals and institutions and make it possible to assess the security of the smart contracts that make up DeFi protocols. The authors also touch on something that's often overlooked, and that's that most individuals and institutions aren't fans of this transparency as it exposes sensitive information about their finances. As far as I can tell, this is why there has been institutional interest in crypto privacy, despite the regulatory concerns. Now, the fourth benefit is somewhat unfortunate, as it has to do with cryptocurrency's censorship resistance, which has come into question on Ethereum after supposedly decentralized crypto platforms, protocols, and even crypto wallets blocked access to Tornado Cash and any associated wallets. The authors seem to reference this reality by noting that dApp creators can decide which transactions to accept or reject, and even go as far as suggesting that, quote, a government could limit a firm's ability to use DeFi to avoid sanctions 
by ordering the firm's suppliers to only accept payments coming from approved blockchain addresses. Yikes. After pointing out that Bitcoin and Ethereum have yet to experience any censorship at the blockchain level, the authors go on to state that, quote, immutability is not necessarily a benefit in all cases, as blockchain transactions that involve fraud or theft might not be reversed as quickly or easily as they would be in traditional finance, which is fair but also terrifying, and also not crypto. This ties into the long list of risks the authors see with DeFi, and the first is the consensus protocols of the smart contract cryptocurrency blockchains themselves. The authors note that these are corruptible if more than 50% of the hash power or stake is controlled by a single entity or set of coordinated entities. Now, if you watched our recent video about Kraken's crypto consensus report, you might recall that the corruption for many proof-of-stake cryptocurrencies is actually much lower, at around 33%, meaning any proof-of-stake smart contract cryptos carry even more risks than their proof-of-work counterparts. The second risk is similarly simple, and that's errors in smart contract code. As we've seen, incorrectly written code is eventually exploited, and this often results in a massive loss of funds. The silver lining is that the traceability of most crypto transactions means many of these funds can be found and returned. The authors also take time to caution that audits are not evidence that a smart contract is secure, and this is something that Yearn Finance founder and phantom developer André Cronier said many times. I wonder what he's up to these days. Hmm. Anyhow, the authors continue by noting that the conditions of a smart contract must be predetermined and are permanent. This means that it's not possible to write, say, a smart contract whose terms and conditions can be easily changed like a real-world agreement. The third risk is that you could lose your crypto forever if you send it to the wrong wallet address or lose access to your crypto wallet, which is just part and parcel of being a responsible self-custodial adult, really. The fourth risk involves transaction ordering. This includes everything from transaction fee competition to minor extractable value, or MEV, which is where miners reorder transactions to benefit themselves rather than process transactions in order of transaction fees as they're incentivized to do. The fifth risk is one I alluded to earlier, and that's oracles. Any issues with the oracles providing pricing data to DeFi protocols means there could be serious threats, such as flash loan attacks between DEXs from DeFi DGENs and unwanted liquidations in borrowing and lending protocols. The sixth risk is especially relevant these days, and that's liquidity. The TLDR there is that many DeFi protocols need large amounts of liquidity, aka crypto, to function properly. An absence of liquidity can cause serious issues, such as price slippage on decentralized exchanges. I'll quickly note that a lot of the liquidity in DeFi comes in the form of centralized stablecoins. As per Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin's own admission, this gives centralized stablecoin issuers significant say in future forks and changes, as they could decide not to support the blockchains they don't like. Now, the seventh risk is straightforward, and that's regulation. I think the authors summed it up quite well with, quote, Regulation may facilitate the growth of financial activities by providing increased confidence to potential users of the services, but it can also have unintended adverse consequences for existing DeFi and its future development. In the next subsection, the authors examine DeFi risks that aren't directly related to DeFi protocols, and they start with a bold claim. Quote, the goal of achieving a truly trustless financial system is unlikely to ever be fully realized. The authors say this because it will eventually become impossible for the average person to be a miner or validator for a cryptocurrency, and I would argue that this ultimately depends on how the cryptocurrency is designed. An easy fix would be to have a trustless base layer with trusted layers on top. The authors then turn to the topic of cryptocurrency governance and seem to send a warning to unnamed crypto projects. Quote, Even when the final control over changes to a blockchain's protocol resides with a decentralized group of stakeholders, 
the group that founded the blockchain often still exercises substantial influence over its evolution. This is significant because the idea that an identifiable third party is driving the expectation of profit from investing in a cryptocurrency is how the SEC decides to go after crypto projects, at least in theory. I reckon we can all think of a few crypto projects which meet that above description. The authors continue by correctly identifying the trade-off between centralization and decentralization, namely that centralization makes it easy for a crypto project to change and adapt, but also goes against the core values of cryptocurrency and eats away at the very things that make cryptocurrencies valuable. Here, the authors reveal that the biggest governance-related risk has to do with blockchain forks, wherein two corners of the same community with opposing views decide to go their own way. This can negatively impact the safety of both crypto projects as well as the liquidity on their blockchains. The authors go on to discuss the governance of decentralized applications and warn that the centralization of token holders for some decentralized autonomous organizations means that they're quite centralized in practice. Note that 1% of token holders have 90% voting power in most DAOs. What's wild is the authors warn that, quote, this risk suggests that, should financial regulators gain authority over finance conducted on blockchains, they should have similar authority over on-chain protocols controlled by centralized groups. Now, call me crazy, but I think that the authors are saying that regulators could potentially become active participants in decentralized autonomous organizations. That said, I'm sure this is meant to mean that regulators will treat more centralized DAOs with the same scrutiny as centralized crypto companies. After discussing the risk of governance attacks on decentralized applications, the authors return to the topic of censorship resistance and make a pretty ridiculous claim. Quote, Governments may have legitimate reasons for censorship. Let me remind you that the Fed is based in the United States. The authors continue by saying that there's a case for censorship at the blockchain level because cryptocurrencies are being used by criminals and countries the United States doesn't like. Ironically, the authors note immediately after that, quote, some blockchain finance operations, CFI and DeFi, are likely to be based in jurisdictions with varied interests in supporting US regulatory goals. Figures. Another non-DeFi specific risk the authors identify is the composability of smart contracts, which can be a blessing when the markets are rallying, but a curse when the markets are crashing. That's simply because composability makes it possible for volatility to become more widespread in DeFi. The authors go as far as suggesting that DeFi developers, quote, invest less than the optimal amount in security, which is not the case as far as I can tell. In the free crypto market, secure, user-friendly, useful, and profitable projects eventually succeed. Full stop. The final area of risk the authors examine relates to the interaction of cryptocurrency and the traditional financial system. They begin by saying that it's more than likely that crypto will exist alongside the traditional financial system for some time, regardless of whether it succeeds in replacing it. This presents a series of risks. And the first is, of course, stablecoins like Tether's USDT, which hold hundreds of billions of dollars of real-world assets as collateral to back the stablecoin tokens in circulation, mostly US government debt. A run on USDT or any other stablecoin for that matter could therefore create serious issues for both crypto and the traditional financial system, which is why the European Union is working to implement a cap on stablecoins as part of its upcoming regulations. More about those in the description. The second risk is the exposure that entities in the traditional financial system have to cryptocurrency. And here, the authors say something disturbing. Quote, As banks and other intermediaries get deeper into providing crypto services and loans to crypto users, these banks may not fully appreciate the risks they are incurring. Now, I'm sure I'm just hearing things, but it really sounds like the authors are saying that crypto users and investors themselves present a risk to the traditional financial system 
due to the fact that they interact with traditional financial services as part of their activities. This would actually be consistent with the endgame of the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, which is to make it impossible to access cryptocurrency without an intermediary by labeling disintermediated activities as high risks. More about that in the description. What's funny is the authors also note that intermediaries in the traditional financial system could end up being sued by disgruntled crypto users in the event that they can't pin down a centralized individual or institution behind the crypto project or protocol which caused them pain. Well, I've yet to see that happen. So this brings us to the conclusion of the report where the authors mostly reiterate what they mentioned earlier, namely that DeFi is growing rapidly and therefore requires regulation ASAP. What's worth noting is that the authors specify that there are, quote, unique concerns arising from the development of DeFi, especially the governance of the code used in dApps. This again suggests that crypto projects with centralized governance mechanisms could soon come under fire. And with that, I must say that I'm impressed. It sounds like the folks over at the Federal Reserve know their way around the crypto industry. Now, this is definitely a double-edged sword because as awesome as this awareness is, it also means that the Fed knows where to direct regulators and lawmakers. On that note, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Fed waited until August to release this report. The SEC seems to have a habit of engaging in many enforcement actions when its fiscal year ends in September. As such, the purpose of the Fed report could be to guide them in their crypto crackdown. Alternatively, the Fed could simply have been providing the information that was requested by US President Joe Biden in his executive order about cryptocurrency earlier this year. If you watched our recent video about important September updates on Coin Bureau Clips, you'll know that the deadline to submit regulatory recommendations about cryptocurrency was the 5th of September. As such, the Fed report could have been a last-minute submission of sorts. In any case, the Fed report is almost certainly bullish for cryptocurrency. I mean, did you ever think that you'd see Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, and Solana in a report from the Central Bank of the United States? Heck, they even mentioned Aave, Curve Finance, and Lido Finance. If that is not a sign that crypto is slowly taking over, I don't know what is. As per a recent Coindesk article, crypto is officially in the quote, then they fight you phase, a phase that's followed by an epic victory, as per the old adage. Make no mistake, however, the incumbents will not go quietly. I expect to see some seriously insane announcements from US regulators in the coming weeks and months, and they're almost guaranteed to do unprecedented damage to the crypto market. Still, it's not going to stop the trend of crypto adoption. And when the next bull market inevitably comes around, we could hit the critical mass required to create a parallel system that can't be crushed by regulations or institutional market manipulation. Mark my words, that day will come. And that's all for today's summary of the Fed's DeFi report. If you found it insightful, smash that like button to let me know. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell so you don't miss the next video. If you want more from the Coin Bureau, the Coin Bureau Clips YouTube channel is where you should go. You can also tune into the Coin Bureau podcast if you want to learn about crypto while you're on the go. If you want to keep up with me, follow along on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram and get your daily dose of crypto updates by joining my Telegram. If you want to know which cryptos I hold as part of my portfolio, you can find out by subscribing to my weekly newsletter, where I also give you my forecast for what comes next in the crypto market. If you want to support the channel, head on over to the Coin Bureau merch store to get some crypto-themed hoodies and socks to stay warm during the energy shortages this winter. Sorry, bad joke. You can find your way to these resources and more by using the links in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Adios, adieu, auf Wiedersehen, goodbye.